What's going on, Knicks fans? Welcome, welcome. It's Jeremy Cohen here for another edition of Cap Rules Everything Around Me. Cream, get the money. Dollar dollar bills, y'all. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really glad we could do this again. Um, clearly, it had enough of a, a good reception where our executive producer, Andrew Claudio, didn't want to pull the plug. So I thank him for that. And we can keep moving on. So uh, we got some stuff to talk about today because there's always stuff to talk about. But I wanted to lead in with one thing that was very relevant that I've been I've been asked about. Um, it happened really in between the last time that I recorded with John for the podcast and now, and that was the sun's crashing, uh, exploding, imploding. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. It was uh, rough. It was very bad. But the reason why I've been asked about it is, of course, because, well, Knicks fans want to know about how they can improve or how the team can improve with the Phoenix Suns being a potential suitor. So instead of doing like a cap or no cap, I just wanted to kind of break it down more casually pretty quickly. So um, I guess where to begin? Let's let's start with let's start with Devin Booker. Why not? Look, he's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, maybe there's a point when he hits free agency that he reconsiders it, but they're not trading him. They're going to keep contending. He is their best player. There is every reason for why he should stay there. I am still fascinated by the idea of he's a free agent, unrestricted free agent in 2024. He is extension eligible this season because he made the all NBA team and can get kind of a super max. Does he sign that contract? I believe it's a four year, $211 million extension. Does he wait? Does he maybe try to sign a one year extension that gets him to the 2025 free agency class? He then can get, 35% 35% of the salary cap instead of 30 because he'll have had 10 years of experience under his belt instead of nine and anything that's 10 or above you get 35% anything that's seven to nine years you get 30%. What's more that's also the summer where the CBA is expected to or the excuse me the TV deal is supposed to be renegotiated and that could create a lot more money. So if you are Devin Booker same thing really with Carl Anthony Towns you could lock yourself in long term or you could probably make a wiser pay and just hope that you stay healthy. So I, you know, fortunately the booker was not one of the people who was asked really about, is he going to stay or go? But I just wanted to put that out there and the plans for him and and what might happen next. I guess we could go with Chris Paul. Um, I thought it was kind of funny how last year we saw an article articles, maybe from a certain tabloid beat writer talking about how the Knicks missed out on Chris Paul and how this is such a you know big problem and look where they could have gone. And a year later, he just had a miserable series and he's 37 years old. He's going to be making a lot of money next year. The year after that, he's got like $14.5 million guaranteed of his 30 some odd million dollar contract. The year after that, it's a $30 million contract that's non-guaranteed. So I just thought it was like, oh, okay, yeah, of course we're hearing it when things didn't seem to go well, but now when things would be in hindsight, the reason why maybe you don't trade for him if you're Leon Rose in the first place, it's Chris Paul. Um, I don't really think Chris Paul is going to go anywhere regardless. Um, maybe he does. Look, if he does, it, it, I can understand the idea for why the Knicks would be interested, the connections, the fact that there is there are questions at the point guard position. I just don't really see it. Um, They're also not going to dump Chris Paul for some sort of poo-poo platter. They would want more. And I don't know if the best assets that the Knicks have and are willing to give up actually benefit Phoenix. Because if we're talking about this year's pick, which is slotted at 11th, it's a rookie. You're not going to be able to field a contender with a rookie playing a significant role. Whereas with Chris Paul, you know, you probably can if anything they might need more depth at the one instead of campaign or elford payton and having someone to back up chris paul to keep him maybe fresher as he goes along but i haven't seen a whole lot about chris paul fortunately at least in terms of the knicks and interest uh so it brings us to the guy deandre ayton and if you read everything that's coming out of there it doesn't seem like things are great between 
Aiton and the Suns. You know, when they originally didn't agree to a contract extension, I thought this could be problematic just based on the fact that even if he's not a max player, he will likely get a max. And so do you kind of want to play the game where you match any offer sheet and there's like a year of resentment? Or do you just give him a max contract? They obviously did not give him a max contract. They let it kind of fester. And they had every right to do it. Don't get me wrong. I think actually maxing him, it's the cost of doing business for a team that wants to poach him. But if you're the Suns, you're bidding against yourself. So I do understand why the Suns didn't commit. But at the same time, this is awkward, right? It's an uncomfortable situation. And so... You know, I don't want to spend too much time on it because we talked about it a bit on the most recent cap or no cap. But the idea of the Knicks and how they are trying to strategize and build their team, paying $30.5 million next year to DeAndre Ayton doesn't seem to fit what their process is. It feels like the Knicks care a lot more about spending money on players who are going to hold on to the ball and, and you know, make decisions that are more advanced than what DeAndre Ayton's doing. I, he's a very good player, don't get me wrong. And again, I think he will probably get some sort of max contract. It's just a matter of, is this someone who the Knicks want to invest money in and essentially build around with RJ Barrett and all these other players? And I don't think it is. Um, the other thought to have with that isn't just kind of the the opportunity cost of what you're spending and not it's well, the literal cost of what are you giving up? Because if you're Phoenix, if you get an offer and a sign and trade that is worthwhile, you do it. But if you don't, then you let him get any offer he wants and you max it. And I think that's the one thing that people should probably keep in mind is that the Suns aren't going to let DeAndre Ayton walk for nothing. And if they want to retain him and then figure it out next year when he has no control, they can and they would you know like if you're phoenix would you really let one of your better assets go i wouldn't i certainly wouldn't and I, just as a reminder the way it would work is if deandre ayton signed in a contract or really an offer sheet then what would happen is that the suns would have the right to match it and bring him back but once the offer sheet is extended the suns can't work out a sign and trade it has to be done where they either match it or let them go. And they're not going to let them go. The reason why it's so tricky with restricted free agency is because these restricted free agents can't sign until the moratorium's over. And we know how fast free agency goes now, right? It flies by. Players go off the board sometimes within the first few hours. So waiting six days to sign a player and then waiting another 48 hours because the team that has his rights can match it you're out eight days and you can't spend anything in that time because your money is tied over into this move. So it's like if if let's say the Pistons, right, let's say they wanted to give a max offer sheet to DeAndre Ayton. They could. But then the by the time the Suns match the offer as soon as six, maybe even eight days, eight could also be the punishment, right? Like the extra 48 hours. How dare you kind of gum up the works for what we're doing? We're just going to uh, screw you over and uh, make you wait even longer. They could do that. And I think that's the reason why we're also seeing restricted free agency be less of a factor. Because not only by nature do you have to overpay to pry a player away, but there's the time value portion of it. You have to wait in order for this player to not have his rights matched in order to grab him. And if you don't, then you're in trouble. So again, I don't think it works for any of them. I do think Cam Johnson is a really fascinating player just because if the Suns do decide to pay DeAndre Ayton and keep him, or even if they work out a sign and trade, Cam Johnson is due for an extension. And I don't really know what's in store for him. There also, there was a rumor about some, um, it was from someone within the Phoenix community who is fairly prominent. I think he had the Devin Booker's coming back for game six in the first round against the Pelicans before anyone. He has his ear to the ground and he's saying that, there was a a superstar, true superstar is what he said, that has had interest in the Suns and has wanted to come over. Look, it's rumor season. I don't know 
what the case is. I don't know what the definition of a true superstar is to this person. Maybe it's uh, a different one than I have, which is different from what John has or different from what Andrew has, which is different from what you have. So who knows? But I mean, they're, they're two obvious names, right? It's, it's the idea of if something goes wrong with the Nets and Kevin Durant, if they could get a sign and trade to work and they could, but they can't exceed the tax apron and Kyrie's there. Is Kyrie going to stay? Is he going to opt in and then the Nets trade him? It, it could be chaos. And then the other one is, is LeBron. I mean, it's someone who he had a cakewalk to the finals in Cleveland and he decided, or at least the Eastern conference finals. And then I got a little harder from there, but he then decided he didn't want it. And he went to a bad Lakers team because he wanted to build something there. And it comes back to the point where, we don't know these people. We don't know what they want. We have no idea where their heads are at. So, you know, if you're LeBron James, you're looking at the Lakers, you're like, I don't necessarily want to be here because just look around you. And he says, I want to go to a place like Phoenix. I want to win a ring with Chris Paul. Maybe Carmelo Anthony goes there. I don't really know. But Chris Paul's family's in LA. LeBron James's family's obviously in LA. Who knows? But it's that sort of thing where, not only do I not think DeAndre Ayton is poachable if you're the Knicks, I think the reason it's that he's not isn't just because of the fact that um, there's interest from other teams, especially that have cap space, but because the Suns are going to aim higher, and they should, because what the Knicks have to offer isn't going to be nearly as good as, you know, whatever they can get from another team. Like how we talked about in the past, Julius Randle, you want to trade up for him. You don't necessarily want to trade down, but it certainly depends on the deal. Ideally, if you're the Suns, that is what's of interest. So, uh, no on pretty much everyone for the Suns, I guess. I think they make sense maybe in a three-team deal, but probably not as constructed. But we shall see. Uh, all right. So, now that we got the Phoenix Suns out of the way, we can talk a little bit more about the Phoenix Suns. Because the first question is from FML Ag or FM Lag. Uh, would Suns Jazz Trade Centers work straight up? Um, no, it wouldn't because you have to deal with two things. Number one, Gobert is making a lot more than Aiden would be. Even if Aiden got 30 and a half million, I think Gobert is like 37, 38. So it might be close for the matching, but there might need to be a little bit of extra kind of salary going in there. But Aiden, people are going to hate this, is a base year compensation candidate. And if you're a base year compensation candidate, then it means that the outgoing salary is 50%. So matching gets really weird. So they would need a third team, one that's under the salary cap, in order to work with them. And the price and everything going on there, I don't really know. Um, maybe that team wants to charge a huge premium for renting out their cap space. Maybe there's an asset that they actually want that is feasible. So, you know, the thing about Phoenix, they also have uh, Jay Crowder's on expiring contract. Dario Saric. Um, they've got Cam Johnson, as I mentioned, who's essentially expiring because he's a restricted free agent the following year. So, yeah, it's uh, could it work? Yeah, you could find a way to make it work. Sure. But it's one of those things where it's so complicated. And also, DeAndre Ayton has to want to go to Utah. And Utah's just never really been a premier free agent location. Understandably, it's a very small market in the desert. I mean, you could say similar about Phoenix, but it's certainly a much bigger market than that. Um, so, you know, it's it's the sort of thing where I don't necessarily see it coming to fruition, but you'd have to like kind of dance around it. Uh, this is from Lunas Amarat. My question, so one of my dream scenarios is trading Julius and 11 for seven and Bledsoe. Does this work out financially? Also wondering your thoughts on moving up for uh, Maturin. I think he's a star. So it's funny that, I was actually expecting someone to bring up this trade because I go back and forth on it. But I think at the end of the day, the way that I see it is we're talking about Julius, who is a starter, right? I know that he has warts and all and fans are sick of him and probably want him gone, but he's a starter. That's just the role he is. Um, Eric Blitz is not even in the rotation, right? He's he's basically dead salary. You know, they can non-guarantee his contract for, I think it's only $3.9 million and walk away. But if the Blazers go about this correctly, I think it'd be smarter for them to operate over the cap, right? Because they've got this $20 million or so traded player exception, like $20.7 uh, 20 and they can absorb 
up to that amount of salary in there and take nothing back. Um, if they go under the salary cap, they actually lose that trade of player exception. So then when you can figure uh, Simons, he has a cap hold. Nurkic, he has a cap hold. Uh, Josh Hart's probably staying there. There's a, um, a funky kind of agreement between the two of them where essentially how he could stay. It makes sense for them to operate above the salary cap because there's more flexibility that way. Here's my thing. If you're the Knicks and you love a prospect at seven, and I mean you are head over heels for this player, can't miss, let's get him in the building, I think this deal makes a lot of sense. But if you feel you can get similar value at 11 that you could at seven, it's not worth it. And I think the big thing here to consider is, yes, fans certainly are looking for Julius Randle to perhaps exit so Obi Toppin can get more playing time. But they're not going to just give Julius away. And I know that there's this sentiment of, oh, my God, there's four more years. One of them is a player option and uh, we have to get rid of him, get cap space. As I've talked about before, if the Knicks want to go above the salary cap in 2023, Bledsoe doesn't really help them. Now, they could flip Bledsoe for a player who has a longer contract. And maybe they could even find a team that does want to get 2023 cap space and is restricted in terms of 2024 because they have extra money on the books. Then they could kind of like try to take Randall, move it for Bledsoe, then move Bledsoe for that more bloated contract, get a little bit of a sweetener for taking on the extra year, and then either open up cap space if it works out for them or keep kicking the can down the road for an additional year. And then maybe a year after that until they're able to cobble enough salary that makes sense to go forward and get a star. But that's much more distant. In the present for right now, I think the way I view it is, you know, that Blazers, uh, or rather, excuse me, the Bucks first round pick in 2025, right? Like that is something that I think would appeal. If you're saying salary, that's crap. And um, the ability to move up four spots. And on top of that, you get a pick that's probably in the late 20s. I think that's, that's a, a you're closer to it, right? I don't know if it's necessarily the deal because if you're the Knicks, maybe you just want to get a legitimate player back in terms of Randall. I'm not even talking about a star, just a player. But then when you consider the fact that, you know, maybe they don't want to do that. (laughs) Maybe the reason they retained him wasn't to effectively salary dump him. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this is a total salary dump, right? Because you're still getting something positive out of it. You're, you're moving up, but I think you need more. Right, Because you want to trade something that is a starter for a starter or a starter plus with any assets for an even better player. And that's not really happening in this deal. So I'd like it for it to be a little sweeter from Portland's side on that sense. Again, I think that the the crazy thing about the Blazers is they could effectively get Julius Randle and Jeremy Grant on draft night and, and still do this, right? Absorbing Grant. They can't do it in the next year because his contract gets a little big, but absorbing Grant and then Bledsoe for Randall. I don't think that they are willing to give up what it costs to get both of them, though. And Randall also can't fit into that trade player exception either. He's making more than Jeremy Grant is. So will it happen? I don't really know, but I I I would want a little bit more from Portland than just moving up four spots and taking on Bledsoe. Uh, And and as for uh, Maturin, I'm not, again, I'm not, the biggest draft person. I don't pretend to be. Uh, I know what the Knicks like. I know what some of these players have in terms of the the fit and the talent, but um, it's just not my forte. I stick to the math. But uh, yes. All right. Next, we've got um, Zaul Martinez. Zaul Martinez. My apologies if I'm butchering your name, <laughs> but let's uh, let's see the question. It is, I think it's better to keep Mitch and give him more game than just lobbying I would move Randall for my point guard, but I'm not trying to add a pick with his departure. Okay. I, um, I'm guessing it's it, lobbing. I may have just, anyways, um, what is Mitchell Robinson doing outside of lobs, right? The Knicks don't post up either. They don't want him to shoot or he doesn't want to shoot. And it seems like more, they don't want him to shoot, but even if Mitch were shooting, is that something we, want to see i i don't really know you know and again i think that getting a point guard to pair with him it won't increase his usage rate 
to a degree where you're getting a player that's vastly different than the one we're seeing right now. And so when you consider that, it's like, yeah, you can retain him, but you also have to think about what he offers you that's going to be more than what we're seeing because we hope that he has a higher ceiling and maybe he can get there. But at the same time, offensively, is he really going to prove that much more? Maybe he, you know, scores a couple more baskets because you have that point guard, but I don't think it's going to be you know, so drastic where it depends. Like you have to keep Mitch at, at um, an unreasonable amount. And naturally people will disagree in terms of what that reasonable amount is or is not. Uh, for me, I still think that it's like $52 million over four years where like 6 million is uh, non-guaranteed in unlikely bonuses and the final year's team option. I think that's fine. I'd be more than happy with that. Get a little higher than that. I don't know if I would do it. I think Detroit's a really fascinating option, as John and I discussed, especially now that they did not land top three in the draft lottery. So maybe it makes them more of a Mitchell Robinson suitor as they're not going to be getting Jabari Smith, Chet Holmgren, or Paolo Boncaro, uh, at least not without making a pretty big trade up. And I just don't think they have the arsenal to do it or are willing to do it. Um, it's from Trizzy H. Yo, Jeremy, let's say Knicks pick up Duran at 11 and Mitch walks. How will we look cap wise? Um, I mean, so here's the thing with Mitch, right? His cap hold right now is a little under $2 million. So if the Knicks stay with where they're at, at 11, and kind of everything stays the same, they probably have like $2.6 million in cap space if they want to go under the cap. If they want to operate over it, they just would keep Taj's cap hold and anything else. If you take away Mitch's cap hold, then you'd probably get like $4.5 million. Not enough to really do anything. You'd have to make other moves. But I think the smart play, if you are the Knicks and you are drafting a center, which uh, quite frankly, I don't think the Knicks should be doing, especially not with their first pick, first round pick. Um, what you could do if you're the Knicks is instead of letting Mitch walk, you then call up whatever team he's going to and try to work out a sign and trade. Even if it's getting a traded player exception, right? Where the Knicks kick a second round pick over to them. And I know you're probably thinking Mitch is walking and we're giving up second round pick. What the hell? It wouldn't be the Pistons second round pick. It'd be one of the, you know, worst ones, the ones that really aren't going to be too great. And the Knicks have four of them, so they can make do, but that's where they would want to go about that. So I think, but the thing is because you can't, you can't go under the salary cap and keep a trade player exception. The Knicks would probably want to do their business. And then the last step would be we're over the salary cap. Now let's do the Mitchell Robinson uh, try sign and trade and go about that way. And if he walks, then that sucks. You don't really want to let an asset go like that. Even with how I'm talking about Mitchell Robinson, you don't really want to let him go for nothing. So ideally the Knicks can get something back in the event that Mitch does in fact leave. Uh, this is from. Jessica, Jessica Carice Elsner. Thank you, Jessica, uh, for the super chat. Very much appreciate it. You've touched on this before, but what are the top three trades that you personally would like to see or hope for? Realistic choices only, of course. I love this new solo show. You are killing it. Well, thank you, Jessica. I appreciate that. Top three. Okay. Um, I think my number one trade is probably still the Gordon Hayward trade. And I know that for some of you, you're wincing, but it, I see it as clearing up the log jam that we know this team has getting a player who is good when he plays, but also doesn't play. And the lack of availability then essentially gives opportunities to the players that the Knicks have who are younger, who might be blocked anyway. Um, again, he's a strong pull-up shooter. He's great in the mid range. He basically takes a lot of the shots that, uh, Julius would probably take, but he does it at a far better clip uh, and he hits them. So that's certainly nice to consider. But yeah, you know, if it, I had first proposed in the initial podcast, what if it's uh, Kemba Walker, Burks, Noel for Hayward and 15 and thinking back, might that be a tad homerish? It's definitely possible. And so here's the thing, right? I'm more than willing to say swap out uh, Burks and include Fournier. And I don't even have to be adamant about getting the 15th pick. I'd like it. Don't get me wrong. The Knicks are still taking on a huge salary commitment for a player who has played 60% of the season the last two years, something like that. 
Uh, it's $31 million, whereas the Hornets would be paying 18 and change for Fournier. They can non-guarantee Nerlens Noel's salary, and Kemba Walker would be a free agent who they could just sign for the veteran minimum because who else is really going to give him more than that? So if you are the Hornets, you're saving $11, $12 million, possibly more with the tax rate because you have to pay um, – Terry Rozier and Miles Bridges and then PJ Washington. So they've got the money woes. I think that it's still, even without the pick, it's trade the Knicks really should pursue because I don't see a lot of other options that fit on the floor, that fit what they like, that fit the contractual part, uh, and that seem to be a positive for the other team. Uh, second trade. I would have said I would love to figure something out in moving up with the Kings. With that said, that's not really a feasible possibility right now because the Kings moving up to four in the draft lottery have probably taken them out of the hunt for trading for their pick or swapping it at least. But I guess the one thing I'll say is the Kings are a team that seems desperate, right? Like I talked a little bit about this on the uh, watch party yesterday, but the Kings having Monty McNair be a free agent, essentially, at the end of the season, doesn't have an extension. The desire to make the playoffs for the first time, they are going to have some sort of desperation. And they've got these contracts of players that they could probably move out and, and throw something out that's positive in as well. Like, like they've Mo Harkless. They have uh, Alex Len. I know John did a newsletter on them recently, and there are these salaries that are small enough where they could still match for some of them, or you could make the math work or whatnot. But, you know, like, what are we really talking about at that point? I mean, like, is it going to be Alec Burks for Mo Harkless? Because you need more than that. What do the Kings really have to offer? It seems like they want a legitimate player. Okay, well, um, are we talking, you know, is there something where you could do Cam Reddish? But then it doesn't really make sense because, yes, they need wings and they could probably use Cam Reddish, but how are they going to work it out? Because they want, a player who is not only win now, but what would they be giving back? Right. Cause the whole goal would be getting the fourth pick, but I don't know how they're able to do that. And you're talking about Julius Randall, but that's not really going to make a whole lot of sense when you've got Sabonis there. So uh, I thought that would have worked, but now it doesn't. So long story of why I pick a trade that I liked doesn't work, but whatever. Um, I guess with the second one, I'll just say, yeah, trading up for a player that the Knicks seems to love. If it is like, Shaden Sharp, and he's there at six or seven. You know, something that's not maybe the the Bledsoe Randall swap, but but at least getting up there. So I guess I'll put that as my second one. And then, um, no, you know what? I'll bump it down. I'll bump it to third, and instead I'll do a, a Jalen Brunson sign and trade. I'm a big Jalen Brunson fan. It'd be nice if the Mavs stopped playing, so I could dive into a cap or no cap. But I'm patient. That's okay other content for you so it's all good in the meantime but yeah i I think that basically all i'll say about brunson for right now i really do feel that the knicks could just benefit from adding a younger point guard than derrick rose and i know rose has a lot of um great attributes that he would offer but i want him to succeed on a contender and I just want someone who's a little bit more durable as well and more on the timeline for the knicks so i guess i'll go Hayward, Brunson, and then a trade up with the lottery or the draft. But I still, depending on the day, you could probably get me to even flip one and two. So thank you for that question, Jessica. Uh, From Mino F, saw this trade on Twitter and wanted to get your thoughts, Jeremy. Randall and pick 11 for Kuzma, 10, cap filler, and future pick. I, I mean, if you're the Wizards, do you, do you really even want to, deal Kuzma for Randall Kuzma had a better season last year um is a better shooter he does a lot well he's a good defender there's a lot of effort there it seems like a lot if you're Washington to give up for a player that maybe isn't quite as good as the one that you had already um and then the pick swap and then additional filler and uh I mean for the additional filler it'd probably have to be Contavious Caldwell Pope. Pope. That's really it. There's not a whole lot else they can do with it where the math works. 
I mean, if you want to include Porzingis, which I don't, you'd then have to add more on the Knicks side and do a whole big thing. I, I don't think that they are the best trade partners, especially because the Wizards are at such a weird point where are they keeping Beal or not? I don't think they should. I, but I understand why Beal would want to stay. If they're the Wizards, you probably just want to move on. But they're also, they've got a whole youth movement themselves, right? Like they have plenty of young talent that's looking to break through and they have a consolidation issue. And especially at the four, I mean, yeah, if you bring Randall in there, sure. But what does that do for Hachimura? For example, is he going to get the Obi Toppin treatment? Because I don't, I don't think he should. Or are they going to be smart? Maybe play more of a five out, explore with Randall at the five. But then it's fascinating for them too because I mean, yeah, they got Chris Stops and they could do something there. But if he's missing time, which I guess then could actually lead more credence to Randall playing. So, regardless, I just don't think that they are the best partners. But um, I like the thought. So thank you. Uh, from Lunas, I'm Rod. Another one. Current pr uh, prediction on RJ extension contract numbers. I mean, ultimately, what like maybe four years, 118 million. That's, I mean, probably starting somewhere like 26, 27. Uh, again, if if RJ wants to agree to a contract that is less than maybe what he could get if he waited a year, then as a Knicks fan, by all means, and, and RJ, if you are comfortable securing generational wealth on top of the amount of money that you have go for it happy for you but yeah i mean it's it's just like how do you parse out what is i don't want to say uh real because so much of it seemed real but it's like when the knicks can actually put rj around players that can make him improve because it's staggering how few minutes rj obi and emmanuel quickly actually shared the floor together and they did fine so it's when you have Randall there, how does that impact RJ? So I, I'm just going to say four years, $118 million. And if it's more than that, then, um, then it's more than that. If it's less then thank you for your sacrifice, RJ Barrett. I, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, from Efrain Lopez. Hey, Jeremy, maybe if the Mavs win the chip, Brunson will be satisfied, satisfied and want to chill with us. Hopefully thinking. Yeah, I was, I was asked if um, if the Mavs playing well and even winning the chip makes Brunson less attainable. And I honestly think you could have an argument for both sides. On one hand, it could be the Mavs pony up and say, let's keep this core together. We don't want to lose Jalen Brunson. We're willing to pay what it takes. This is clearly a contender because Luka Doncic is healthy and exists. On the other hand, if they did, you could see them maybe saying, we did what we needed to. We won a championship. Uh, I would love to retain a player like Jalen Brunson, but if we can, if he's gone, like if he's choosing to leave elsewhere for a lot more money and we get a sign and trade where we get a player back that is um, close to it, maybe they sign a player like Gord Dragic, who uh, was a buyout candidate this year and chose foolishly. The Nets could have gone to Dallas. Obviously, there's the Slovenian connection between him and Luka Doncic so yeah maybe if he stays he's content and they pay him more um, or maybe if they win he stays and they pay more but maybe they're cool and and you know sated with their championship we, again I, I go back to the point which is so relevant in a lot of ways we don't know these people it's so hard to parse out where their heads at what they want to do like who would have thought Jeremy Grant would have left Denver, what seemed like a, a young budding contender for Detroit for the same money, just a larger role and um, emphasizing how important the history of Detroit and the African-American culture was to him. It's not something that we would have necessarily predicted. And yet he did it. And um, ironically, it seems like they're looking to flip him. But um, that's that's why it's a business. Uh, next question. We, it's from uh, again, me no F. Uh, what are some guys you could see? Who, excuse me, who are some guys you could see traded on draft night? Examples Grant, Randall, etc. I mean, even if you're the Knicks, right? Like, maybe you do the Hayward trade I'm talking about or that I, I was mentioning. Because actually, the funny thing about that, if it were just Kemba Fournier, Noel for Hayward. No picks attached. 
the Knicks actually would gain cap space this summer. They'd go from like 2.6 to $8.9 million or something, which I think is pretty important because then you're very close to doing the second trade, which is a Jalen Brunson sign and trade, if that's something that you wanted to go about doing. But in terms of um, players being traded, again, that the Kings pick is just so fascinating to me because they could go best player available and maybe it's Jaden Ivy, but I still don't quite know what the fit looks like there. Um, it's just really fascinating for where they could do. So are they willing to package for and, you know, salary to get someone else? I don't know. I, I really don't know, but they're such a wild card that I could see it potentially happening. Um, we've also got, I think the, Pacers have a traded player exception, but they can also create cap space. So on draft night, you know, draft nights, I feel like have become less crazy in terms of dealing players. Maybe I'm making that up, but I'm just thinking like, yeah. And in, um, there was the Dario Saric trade in 2018, 2019, 2019. But other than that, I feel like the lottery hasn't had a ton of, notable players. I mean, Sarch wasn't exactly notable, but maybe it's, it's something that's there. So, uh, but for other deals, I mean, the wizards, maybe, although again, they're, there's like, if they traded Bradley Beal on draft night, if he opted in, which he can do op takes his player option and, and signs it and then gets traded. That's something that could certainly happen. Um, curious what happens with the nets and Kyrie. Is he going to opt in more of a lesser name player, but you never know. It's a weird year. Every year is a weird year, but especially this year. Uh, next, we have Akiva Friedman. Would you put the 11th pick in a deal for Brogdon? I would not. I wouldn't do it. I understand why a lot of Knicks fans like Malcolm Brogdon. It, he just he doesn't really move the needle for me. You know, even with a Randall trade, it's like, again, I know we're frustrated with Randall. I, I know the problems, but like, do you really want a 30 year old who has foot problems and, and keeps missing games? I get the size factor. I understand the defense. The shooting hasn't even been as um, great as it was when he had a 50, 40, 90 season. And again, I, I know that's a very high bar to try to top, but it hasn't really been great. Um, and then, you know, the idea that he's maybe the type of player who wants to run the show. What does that mean? Are, are we running the offense through Brogdon? I don't necessarily want to do that. I want to run the offense through RJ Barrett. I just don't love the idea of Brogdon generally, but I definitely don't want to include the 11th pick. Again, I think that if the Knicks feel like this is the last opportunity they'll have for a while to be in the lottery, they should make the most of it. And that's trading up. If they find that the player that's attainable is worth it. And of course, that doesn't cost too much, which feels like you're narrowing and narrowing it more and more. But in terms of flipping it for a veteran, I don't think we're at that point. I think we still need to see the Knicks focus internally, bring the best young talent that they can, just grow and develop um, their younger players, keep some of the veterans around to help support them. And then when the time's right, make some sort of uh, larger move. Uh, next, we have a question from Andrew Claudio. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Jeremy. First time, long time. You were asked last night, but gave an incorrect answer. Giving you another shot. Rangers in four, five, six, or seven. See, here's the reason why I did not give the correct answer. It's because I have found that I'm usually a very optimistic person, at least I try to be. But when it comes to like, especially my sports teams, I get pessimistic as a coping mechanism. So if they disappoint me, I don't have to feel so bad. So for the Rangers game, game seven, uh, loved watching it as a blast, but also terrifying. Uh, it'd been a while since I had experienced that level of playoff hockey for my own team. And it was great, but I was pessimistic pretty much the entire game because it was the Penguins and the refs and blah, blah, blah. Even when uh, it was overtime, I turned to one of my roommates. and was like, it doesn't matter. The Penguins are going to win. And then the Rangers scored. And I said, yeah, never a doubt. 
the reverse jinx. So, uh, no, Andrew, I believe for the for the sake of all that is holy with the Rangers, I answered correctly. And I'm sticking with the Hurricanes in six. Because if I don't, then maybe the Rangers actually have a chance. So that is why I'm going with the Hurricanes. Next question is from House Flan. I think uh, the Kings would trade Davion to Knicks for 11 and Cam. That's a good question. I don't believe so, though, because then it's like the risk that they run is who's available at 11 and what is Cam Reddish? We don't really know. Um, we have we have an idea for some of the things he does well. We know what he has potential in, but a lot of it is kind of unanswered. And I get the idea for why it would make sense, but I think if I'm the Kings, I probably just want to stand pat. And it depends, of course, who's on the board at 11, right? Like, yeah, they, they could, by doing it, they could kind of um, uh, diversify in that way for having two players instead of one. But then they also have to worry about paying Cam Reddish next year. Is that something they want to do? Are they trying to be frugal? I don't really know. But I think that the Kings probably stand pat. I think the I think the Knicks would probably consider it. I don't know if they would pull the trigger on it, but they apparently liked Davion last year. At the end of the day, though, here's the thing. It's like, are you trading your 11th pick? And I mean, it's not a first-round pick anymore, but it was the Hornets' first-round pick that turned into Cam Reddish and and that value. I know you can't really look at it that way, but it's still sort of the thought of two first round picks for, uh, for you know, the ninth pick overall last year. I think it's, it's an interesting trade. I don't think the, the Knicks or the Kings do it, but I, I do get the logic behind that hundred percent. So it was good. Uh, this is from Knicks film school. Thanks for being the handsome half of the Sunday pod. Who's your most interesting team of the summer from a Knicks perspective hmm i'm not even thinking of a team i'm just i'm just thinking of the, the handsome part that was very flattering thank you i would say in terms of teams well again it would have been the kings it still can be but they just don't have as as much to offer i i'll go with so one option is the blazers right as we mentioned the whole thought process of what they're going to do, how they want to go about it. I don't know where their head's at. It seems like they want to build around Dame. And yet at the same time, they're, you know, they're kind of doing what the Knicks are doing. If the Knicks had a superstar and less good young talent, they're certainly someone to watch, but man, in terms of other teams, I mean, if we go through, let's do it. Let's go through the list really quickly and just see what's there. Um, I know a lot of people might think the Lakers. I, I again, unless Russ is going to a third team, I don't just I just don't see it. But I still think Charlotte is a very prime trade candidate team, especially when you consider um, the center position. If there's anything they want to do there, other than that, you know, it gets tricky. I think that there's some good teams like teams that were in the final eight, maybe even the playoffs in general that could use an Alec Burks or a Derek Rose, but you know, like Phoenix, they could have certainly done it. If you did Derek Rose for Sarge, for example, you're cutting salary. If you're the Knicks, I'm not saying it's that straight up. I'm not saying they should do it just as an example. That's the type of thing that they could do um, with Milwaukee. I mean, the only salary they really have, well, it's George Hill is making $4 million and it's Grayson Allen. Either of those really appeal. Like, yeah, you, you could get the 24th pick from the bucks after they make their selection, but you know, so I'll, I'll say them that, that, you know, there's like, there are enough teams that could use more depth and players that can help them get through the regular season. And also in the playoffs, something that the two teams I just mentioned and some others, could have really used. So that's something to consider. Jason M. I could see the Jazz wanting Randall if they move on from Gobert and try to build around Mitchell. Is there a deal there that excludes Gobert and Mitchell? The salaries there are Clarkson, Bogdanovich, 
think that's there's a uh, Juancho Hernan Gomez uh, movie star Juancho Hernan Gomez. He is on a non guaranteed contract. I think it's like seven million dollars or something. So they could find a way to get there. It's just I think it'd have to be a three team deal where Gobert goes out, whatever team that gets him sends something to the Knicks, and then the Knicks send Randall and more salary. I don't know. Maybe it's uh it's well it wouldn't be Kemba. They send Burks home. I don't. I don't think so. But you know, one of those types of players. Maybe they do it, and then that—that's the closest you could get in terms of getting Randall there. But that, this is why I'm so eager. I mean, I know we're all eager for free agency and the draft because we've been waiting for a long time. But I'm so eager because of the Julius Randall value. Because look, like if his value is, I mean, we know his value isn't the highest, right? We know it's on on the lower end, but even on the lower end, is it still neutral value? Is it negative value? Is it positive value? Are there enough teams out there that see him and feel he's the best option that they have given the cost that it might take to get him? We won't know until we see it, but it's just, it's so fascinating. And because it seems like, at least I've seen some of my mentions where there are people who are totally fine with Randall staying. Not a lot. Don't get me wrong. There aren't a lot of people who are fine with that. Most people are very, very much against it. But staying in the sense of like, if his value is going to be so low, at what point do you just hang on to him? Then you have the Obi Toppin conversation and it just gets messy, which is why I still think the best thing to do is to move on. But in terms of like how you are able to do that and not selling so low on Julius Randle that you just, it wasn't worth it. I don't know. So we'll see what his value is in a month and two weeks, maybe. Yeah. Um, let's see. Where's our next question? This is from Dirty Dancer. How did you have a three-hour podcast on Mitch and not even discuss your walkaway number? I mean, I kind of did. Uh, like, again, I wouldn't. I said four years and like $52 million with $6 million in unlikely bonuses. I wouldn't really do much more than that. Uh, like, are we going to like, are we going to talk about 55? Cause I, I don't, I personally don't see it. I don't see him being worth that, but I, I guess it was more implied that like the fair amount for where we could go is probably where I'm comfortable with, because I don't even think his value gets much greater than that point. Again, I know that we love Mitch. Uh, I know he's a, a Nick. Um, also, we know about the, whatever that uh, post, the story was that he posted. Like also just, don't don't be on your phone and drive, especially at 71 miles per hour. Just not worth it. But, you know, like I think to me, that was probably what my walkaway number was, because I based on how the Knicks use their centers, there is a limit to it. And it's not that I'm anti paying Mitch. because Yes, the salary cap is going to increase. Um, you can find a good deal. It's just a matter of at what point is what Mitch does in such a low usage capacity replaceable especially on the offensive end. On the defensive end, it's a little bit trickier, but can you get to a point where you get, if like if you're getting 75% of production for half the cost, is that something that appeals to the Knicks more than simply paying Mitchell Robinson? We'll find out. But I think at the end of the day, that's the type of contract that makes the most sense for both sides. It feels like a compromise. If anything, it feels like probably paying Mitch a little bit more than he might get in the open market especially if it's slightly above the mid-level exception, which uh, it would be, especially with the unlikely bonuses, which can't come with the mid-level exception. And if he hits them and works hard enough, then he would be making four years, $52 million. It's then the question of the fourth year, the team option, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, my cutoff is $52 million, which was the deal mentioned. Uh, next, we have a question from Amino um, you know F. If they do end up making the draft pick, do you see all the young guys on rookie contracts back next year? This is a great question. I still, leading into the draft, again, I really thought that the Knicks could find a way to kind of parlay Cam and 11 to move up. And they still could do that, right? Like that would be one example of a player who is on his rookie contract who's no longer going to be here. I think you could move Deuce 
for salary purposes. And if you're bringing in someone like Brunson and you have Brunson and IQ, it lessens the need for Deuce McBride. So I'm not saying I want to give Deuce away by any stretch of the imagination. It's just at what point, if you feel like there is a clear obstacle for him to really get playing time, unless someone ahead of him is hurt and you don't want that to be the case, is he still here or is he, or can he be treated essentially as an asset? I, you know, like Tibbs didn't exactly do him any favors in terms of uh, the value that he provides. <laughs> he didn't really play much. There were times where, Probably should have played more. Not probably. He should have played more. And it didn't happen. So, you know, but he's he still has two years left of his contract. It's two-thirds of the way to go. Something to keep in mind. So maybe he's the type of player who might get shipped out. But, you know, I think in terms of the if they're keeping the pick, right? It's it's the pick, it's RJ, it's Obi, it's quickly, it's Cam, Grimes, McBride. I'm probably missing someone that I I left out and just hate. But then, well, let's see. I mean, Kemba, Noel, Randall, Burks, Fournier, regardless. I think they'll make a move. I think they'll move at least one of them. It's more that, and I'd mentioned this earlier in in a tweet today. It's like, my whole thing is you can still have a lot of the young players. You can even have, you know, you can have whatever players drafted be in the Grimes role. It's just a matter of, are you willing to also move a player ahead of him, him being the player drafted? I don't really know. But that's also why, again, like if you consolidate and and make room, then we're not really necessarily even asking the question of, are there too many young players? It's what can we do to get these guys more minutes? Well, if you get a player who is good but doesn't play a whole lot or is injured, and if you're able to clear up other spots, then hopefully you are able to just keep everyone and you can facilitate a trade next year, two years, three years, whatever it is. Just keep going down the line. Uh, This is from Reynaldo Maldonado. What do you think about what Bagley said about the Knicks trading the pick? You think it's a good idea to trade it? If you trade the pick, I think it needs to be as part of a package for a player whose ceiling is higher than that of the picks, right? Like if you're trading the pick and salary and other assets, you could do it, but then who's the player you're getting in return, right? Because for me, I don't really, I don't want to get a, a a starter using this pick and another contract because, uh, I basically feel like with this front office, they've done such a good job of drafting. Is there a guarantee that this pick is even starting caliber? No, definitely not. But at least I'll take my chances kind of developing that player into something else. And then when the timing is more correct, you can look at what you have and deal from your surplus. Again, like if it's a star, it depends on who the star is. It depends on what the cost is. If we're talking Donovan Mitchell, Again, I'm not super in favor of it, but also because I just don't see him really going anywhere. So what other star is there? And like, if it's a Zion Williamson type player, hands down, yes. That pick can be flown to New Orleans. You know, we can can do a GoFundMe for like a private jet. Not that we need to. They're billionaires. They can afford it. But like, that's the type of move where if you can get a high ceiling player using that pick and other assets that's when I consider moving it. It just, you want it to be a guy who's a little younger than Donovan Mitchell, but then the trouble with, and I'm not saying he's old and he can't be that guy, but then the problem is how many of those players are available and how much they cost and is it worth it? So I would lean towards, towards keeping the pick. Uh, and then Akiva saying, FYI, Jonathan Wasserman said today that he sees the Knicks trading back is more likely trading up and said they go back into drafts with their guys and cited trading trading back for IQ, Grimes, Deuce, and Rokas. Yeah. I mean, 100%. But at the same time, I think Wasserman's kind of forgetting that the Knicks were willing to trade up for Obi Toppin. They were willing to go to five. They traded up for Emmanuel quickly. I mean, they, well, they probably traded up for Tyrese Maxey. But when Maxey went off the board, 
they still packaged 27 and 38 to move up to 23 for quickly. And then they moved back and collected another asset to recoup. And then they traded out and got uh, a future pick because they realized they could go later. So yeah, the Knicks do trade down, but their first and their first instinct seems to be how can they trade up? And it's an important one because if the draft is better than, you know, if it's, if there's higher likelihood up top, then I think that's worth it. That's, that's really something you should do. Um, Dirty Dancer again. Since you think this is our last lotto pick potentially, are you more open to trading future picks for a guy like Aiden? Uh, I talked about Aiden at the top of the show. Not really. Again, I just the Knicks don't seem to operate in a way where they want to invest that type of money into a center. Um, again, like I think ideally this should be the last year that the Knicks are in the lottery, but who knows? Like we probably left last season thinking the Knicks aren't going to be back in the lottery. Or maybe some did, of course, but I felt like if the Knicks are in the lottery, that's okay. They've got time on their side, but I'd certainly prefer that they're not. And now they're back in the lottery. And then there's the question of, would they be back in the lottery again? And if they are, what assets do they have to trade up then? Do they want to trade up? Can they find good talent? So, yeah, I, I, I just think that staying the course for another year and then reassessing even at the deadline although I don't know how much would be changing then, but you never know. Um, and then waiting for another year. I'm going that. Uh, Andrew Claudio has asked a very important question, possibly the most important question in the entire podcast. Do the Yankees lose ever again? 153 and nine. It's a great question, Andrew. I'm going to just go with the Rangers thing, though. I see what you're trying to do here. I know you're trying to get me to be optimistic about the Yankees because if I am, then they're going to lose a bunch of games and then they're not going to go 153 and nine. So I saw some ridiculous stat or something that like the Yankees could go 500 the rest of the season and they'd still finish with over 90 wins. Not bad, but listen, it's fun to be a Yankees fan. It's fun to be a Mets fan for those of you, I'm sure who are Mets fans. That's uh, certainly something that seems enjoyable uh, just based on how they're playing. Obviously, Drop their first series of the year, but to be able to go through the middle of May without losing a series, that is super impressive. So it's fun when baseball is just good in the Bronx period. I think that's uh, super enjoyable. Um, all right. And now here is, I guess we can probably wrap this up here with uh, last question. This is from uh, the one, the only Chris Percy Einan. Chris has a great show. If you have not caught it, draft class, it's wonderful. Um, really great stuff he's able to do. I have some awesome contributors in there, and, and he has some wonderful insight on his own right. So uh, check that out, please, if you haven't already. Um, episodes out every Saturday, I should, I should add. But uh, this is from Chris. He says, are you willing to take a total home run swing at 11, like Usman Jang, Bryce McGowan's, or Jalen Williams, or would you want a pick more like Sohan, Eason, Daniels. I go back and forth on this, Chris. I really do because I feel that the lottery, right? Like where you are, you need to take some sort of home run swing. But the problem is that our idea of a home run swing is just this player oozes potential. What do they do? Well, uh, you can't teach their length. Okay. But what do they really do? Uh, well, it could just, come along. So I, again, like that is what we're working off of. And it's really hard to do. It's really hard for me to think about like, do you want to get someone who's so good, but you could wind up taking a huge strike. And then if you do, was this season worth it? It wasn't. I mean, was the, was the 2017, 18 season worth it? No, no, it wasn't. Was the 2016, 17 season worth it? No, it was not. So then you look back at the other years and Knicks didn't even have draft picks. And it's basically the same thing, maybe even worse, because then you could at least, you know, say to yourself, well, they don't even have picks to blow. And then they did for it. And I, I'm not saying this front office is going to blow a pick, but part of me feels like unless you're trading up and you're certain about a guy, probably go more for like the standard hit a double. Or like that, if you can get a quality rotation piece at 11, 
you've actually done well for yourself. It may not seem like that. And I know there've been a lot of good picks, 11, 12, 13, 14 in recent years. You can find good talent there. But at the same time, like there's nothing wrong with turning a draft pick in a draft that is like every year, a total crapshoot and just having that be an asset moving forward. Cause the moment a player is picked, their value fluctuates like crazy. That's the appeal of a future draft pick. It could be anything, but now you're dealing with something that's a little different. So I think that again, my goal is my, my priority at least, or what I'd like for the Knicks to do is trade up a little bit, right? Like six, seven, eight, get in that range, attach the, the Dallas pick if they have to, to get there. Um, maybe it's a younger player that's not named RJ Barrett, Obi Toppin or Emmanuel quickly. That's all fine by me. It's more if they don't have that opportunity, do they take the home run swing at 11 as Chris is asking? <sighs> they utilize the G league really well. At least it seems do certainly spent plenty of time there, but I think you have to go just hit a solid double. It's why I like a player like Johnny Davis uh, or Tari Eason. I mean, or you could say any of the players that, that Chris mentioned, there's appeal there. But just turning that pick into an asset in and of itself is worth it because you'd hate to if, if you get a home run and you hit it, it's a home run, obviously. But if you miss, you look back at this year and the draft pick was and the development, too. But the draft pick really was kind of what the reward was for a disappointment. So I guess I'll go with play it a little safer if you're staying at 11. And then uh, one last thing, as I know, Andrew posts this from. Uh, you know, F throwback to a joke Jeremy made in an older episode. Jeremy, did you recognize Wes at the lottery with his shirt on? Uh, I didn't even think of that. That's a great point. Yeah. If Wes had his shirt off, would the Knicks have won the lottery? Who's to say? Did Brock Holler have his shirt on in the lottery when the ping pong balls were going? I don't know. If he did, I think we have to start asking some serious questions about why were these two men wearing clothes. So, all right. That's a great note for me to end on. Um, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Really appreciate it. I know that this will be staying on YouTube to be released in podcast form as well. Again, we're going to be doing this every Wednesday, 6 PM Eastern standard time. And um, really have had a blast with these questions. Keep them coming guys. Thank you so much. Really look forward to the next one. Um, until then have a great week. I know we've got some other content coming up uh, very soon. And then on Sunday, you will be hearing once again from uh, John and myself and Andrew. So, And on Saturday, of course, Chris Persian and draft class. Thank you again. Uh, go Knicks and uh, be well.